So, um, welcome to this session. I'm uh, Richard Sassoon. I'm the Executive Director of the Strategic Energy Alliance. And welcome to the session on, on buildings and facilities. Um, before we get started, let me just say how delighted I am to see you all here. Uh, Jenny Milne and I have organized the agenda for this research showcase. And we really appreciate the interest and participation uh, by so many of you who support and do so much hard work uh, to make this re energy research endeavor at Stanford uh, so effective. So in this session, we're looking at the energy and sustainability issues associated with facilities. And what better place to investigate this than Stanford University itself? It represents a, a perfect living laboratory for studying this, this subject. And today we're very lucky to have two of probably the best people on campus who can address this uh, subject. First up, we'll have um, Lincoln Blevins. He's the Executive Director for Sustainability and Energy Manage Management at Stanford. And he leads the university's efforts in sustainability and resilience, utilities, and infrastructure. And he will tell us about the enormous efforts and investments that Stanford has made in decarbonizing its energy systems and operations. Um, after Lincoln, we'll have Jacques de Chalandin. He's an adjunct professor in the Energy Science and Engineering Department at Stanford. And he'll broaden things out and describe his research on developing and applying um, computational tools for flexible urban energy systems using Stanford as a, as a test bed. So, um, I'll turn it over to Lincoln. We'll, he'll speak, and then we'll have time for a few questions for Lincoln, and then we'll do the same with Jack, and then if there's any time at the end, we can bring everything together. So Lincoln, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It is a uh, tremendous honor to be here and telling the Stanford story, which I absolutely love to tell. What we've done here is pretty astounding. What I'd like to do is give you an overview of the supply side, the macro side of the Stanford Energy System, and then Jacques can do uh, get you through the really, what I think is the truly interesting stuff now, which is the more micro inside the buildings. So I have the coolest job in the world, just to give you a, a, a sense of this. What my group does covers the entirety of the Stanford ecosystem both internally and externally. And we get to make sustainability real. We get to make resilience real across the utilities and the essential services, the beating heart, really, of Stanford University. We do that in the context of some very significant goals. We're looking at zeroing out scopes one and two for greenhouse gas by 2030, and zeroing out, and this is the mother of all goals, scopes one, two, and three by 2050. Um, the whole world is figuring that out as we go. We're doing great work here, but this is truly a global effort to figure out both scopes one, two, and three by 2050. So when we talk about Stanford Energy System Innovations, which is the umbrella catch-all title for what, we're, what we've done, I want to emphasize the word system. It's very easy if you've been over to the central energy facility on the west side of campus to think of that as the big innovation. But the truth is it's an innovation both at that level in an industrial facility but also a system that provides the, the essential electricity and thermal energy services to the campus. So when we looked at our end-of-life cogeneration plant about 15 years ago. Cast your mind back about 15 years. Natural gas-fired cogen, which is what we had, was actually a very reasonable solution in the policy environment of the day. It would have been very easy for us, I think very defensible for us, to simply say, you know what? We got an old cogen, let's build a new, more efficient cogen, Natural gas is better than coal, et cetera, and so on, and off we go. We didn't do that. We didn't lean back on old solutions. We leaned in 
to new solutions. We challenged the most fundamental assumptions that we had. Do we need steam, for example? Do we need fossil fuels, for example? And the fundamental innovations that we came up with for the system, none of these are rocket science. But put together, they're transformative. Going from a retail posture with the California grid to a wholesale posture, that in turn allowed us to enter directly into solar PPAs across California to transition from fossil to renewable, taking a whole lot of waste heat that was otherwise being evacuated to the atmosphere and turning that into fuel through a heat recovery chiller. Moving from steam to hot water, moving from a very high temperature, energy intensive product to a lower temperature, much less energy intensive product to meet our needs. We didn't, we thought, everybody thought you needed steam. That's been the answer for, what, 250 years? But the, 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 re, the reality was, we challenged that assumption we didn't need steam. And then finally, energy storage. We went from basically zero energy storage to both thermal energy storage here on campus as well as electric storage at one of our solar farms. So again, none of these things are rocket science, but put together, they're transformative. Here's the centerpiece. This is the central energy facility. And if you haven't toured it, I would encourage you to reach out to me. I would love to take you through it. It is the most beautiful industrial facility I've ever been in. Also really, really cool. Um, and, and you can really see the innovation. But this is on the west side of the campus. We also have a smaller version on our campus at Redwood City, about 5% the size of this facility. And basically what this is, is thermal energy storage, electrically driven chillers, heat recovery chillers, creating hot and cold water that go out into almost 30 miles of pipe throughout the campus to heat and cool the buildings. We entered into our first of two solar power purchase agreements back in 2016. This covered about 66%, about two thirds of our campus electricity consumption. We're offsetting fossil consumption with renewables. And then just last year, our second project went online. This is near Lemoore, California, about three hours away. And this is, it's a, we have part of a project called Slate, which is a Goldman Sachs project ultimately. And it is currently the biggest solar plus battery storage project in the state of California. So we have a share of the solar panels. We also have a big share of the batteries. And that takes us to about 120% offset of our cons electricity consumption on campus, both electricity to keep the lights on and do things that electricity does, but also to produce thermal energy. This is my favorite graph in the entire world. This is our carbon journey, and you can see, I call it the carbon cliff. You can see what business as usual would have looked like. That's that black line going off into the distance. But you can see the reality too, and that is when that, when the thermal plant went online, when that first solar project came online, we fell off a cliff in terms of carbon production. Huge win. We fell off another cliff when the second project came online. We still have a way to go. We still have about 18% from our peak that we need to reduce by 2030. Huge challenge because it's not big steps like this. It's tiny little steps um, in our, our larger energy portfolio, but an incredible outcome from a greenhouse gas perspective. But not just greenhouse gas, criteria pollutants, which drive energy justice, environmental justice outcomes, and, and our ability to breathe the air. Our water consumption, down millions of gallons a day. Our end user costs, down, I, I'm, I probably shouldn't tell you the number out loud, but significantly reducing our end user costs. One of those is the result of distribution efficiency. And that should be going up. It should be distribution losses going down. I apologize for that. But when we had steam running through the campus, we were losing about a third of it, a third in distribution. Now, instead of 30 some odd percent losses, we've got like 3% losses 
Imagine the economic and environmental impact of an order of magnitude reduction in losses. And finally, service interruptions. A cogen plant, any sort of rotating equipment like that, combustion equipment, you probably max out in the low 90%. We're just not seeing that anymore. We're seeing absent last June's uh, power outage, which I'll talk about in a second. We were seeing five, six nines reliability instead of 90%. All energy is compromise. All energy is compromise. And this, what we've done, has a significant number of them. A couple of, that I want to point out. One is significant initial capital costs. If you spend any time with green infrastructure, you know that the initial capital costs are significantly higher than traditional legacy fossil infrastructure. That said, the operating costs and the environmental benefits are much, much better going forward. The question that I'm wrestling with is, how do we get not just Stanford University, but everybody else in the world over that green monster, over that green cliff of capital so that they can enjoy the benefits? The other thing that we've, the other big uh, compromise that we made, and this came true in June, was that we are entirely dependent on the California grid. I mean, we have emergency generators, but from a bulk power supply perspective, we are entirely dependent on the California grid. And that is obviously not perfect, uh, as we saw last June in particular. But a, you know, a lot of benefits, a lot of compromises. My team is currently working through the compromises now and trying to mitigate those. As I said, we've got about 18% of the way to go on our journey to net zero scopes one and two. A lot of smaller stuff. You see the big drop we had with the, the, the energy system coming online and a lot of cats and dogs that we need to uh, figure out uh, as we get to 100%. And that includes scope three emissions too. Like I said, the entire world is figuring out scope three in real time. We have a very aggressive effort here at Stanford to try to both understand it and make it happen. But I was talking to some uh, business school students yesterday and they said, what should, I, you know, what should I focus on? I said, if you can figure out scope three, you've got a, the best, you know, you, you've not only done well for yourself, but you've done great for the world. Um, this is a massive challenge for our planet. One of the things that we found in the pursuit of all of this is that technology is the glamorous thing. And this is, this is my like liberal arts major formula up here. So take it with a grain of salt, but illustrative. The technology, the ones and the zeros, it's glamorous, it's fun. People love having their picture taken next to it. But without behavior change, you don't get the outcomes that you want. And without project management and change management, none of those hap things happen in the first place. So one of the things that I've been telling a lot of students is if you get out of here without a project management course or a change management course, you've done yourself a disservice. But this is how we've, I've found we can solve for climate positive impact. It's not just the technology. It's got to be the change management, the project management, and it's got to be behavior change. People love technology. People hate to change their behaviors. Um, but that's what we got to do going forward. Next steps, we are in the process of a comprehensive update to our 2015 Climate Action Plan, um, chasing near term the 2030 goal, longer term the 2050 goal. And I'm happy to provide these slides, but this is a good summary of everything that we've done and everything that we're planning on because we are committed. We're gonna do this. A lot of it, I don't know how we're gonna do it, but we're gonna do it. And we are gonna make a, the right optimized solution for Stanford University, but by doing so, we're also going to provide an exemplar for the rest of the world in the same way that we have with the work that we've done so far. So. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Jacques, and he's going to tell you the cool stuff that we're doing on the other side of the value chain in the buildings. 
Jack. Yes, let's thank Lincoln. And are there any questions for, for Lincoln? Uh, yeah, there's one at the back over there. Sure. Maxine, there's one over at the back. Hi, I'm uh, Ole Ayers, an alum from CS at Stanford. Um, I th this is wonderful progress that Stanford's facilities have accomplished. I'm wondering to what degree should Stanford feel responsible for the houses that its employees and students live in, their private homes? You know, what fraction of those have been decarbonized is probably in the single digits, whereas you are up in the 80s now. Is, can you talk a little bit on, on that perspective? Um, probably not as much as you'd like me to. Um, I honestly, I've, I've been here about two years and change. I probably, I know about as much as you do about that topic. I'm, I'm not being, I'm not uh, running away from the question. I just don't know the answer. Uh, qu a quick question, Peter Rumsey, adjunct lecturer. Um, I'm super impressed and, and universities everywhere in America are, are envious of this project on the central utility system. I guess there's a lot of us who, who are wondering what happened with the, the cooling outages, and, and maybe you could just address that a little bit. Uh, sure. Um, before my time, but I, I know the story. Um, when we first planned this system, and the central energy facility in particular, this was 2010, 2011, that planning, which was incredibly rigorous, had assumptions for campus growth and assumptions for what I call the climate curve. How quickly is it going to get hot um, and how hot? Both of those assumptions turned out to be too low. And so instead of running into capacity constraints on peak days, in 10, 15, 20 years, we ran into them in a couple of years. There's also a decision made at the time that we're not going to build for the absolute peak day. We're going to build for the, the kind of normal peak day. And so when the growth happened and the climate curve happened much faster than we thought, all of a sudden we were in curtailment. The system worked fine, but the system just wasn't big enough to handle that load. And so what we've done in the meantime, and we just finished this uh, a few months ago, we've actually doubled the cooling capacity within that building. We have doubled the cooling, the, the ability to produce chilled water. And that's gonna, that's gonna keep us good for a long time. Um, but I can tell you, especially me, my blood pressure took a step change down now that we're getting into hot weather and I've got double the cooling capacity at the CEF. So it was, I think it was, a, it was a policy decision around building for the absolute peak, but then it was planning assumptions that seemed very reasonable at the time and turned out to be not uh, conservative enough. Okay, we have one more question over here and then we'll move on to share. Hi, uh, thank you. I, I'm Andrea Krauss from PG&E and uh, really impressive stuff. I really liked your formula at the end that you showed and I was curious whether you could share one example of maybe a less shiny, exciting change management accomplishment that was key to what you walked us through from a technology perspective. I'll, I'll give you actually the least glamorous example and that's trash. My group uh, is doing waste management. We run waste management for the university. And we have a zero waste by 2030 goal. We also have a contract with our vendor that goes back to the invention of sliced bread. Sliced, bre sliced bread was invented in the early 30s. This contract goes back before that. We, literally, we haven't rebid it. What we're doing is taking that same sort of approach. How do we reorganize ourselves from a technology, from an infrastructure perspective, whether it's different bins or and, and different trucks and different routes and data collection, both for operational improvement but also compliance. But then how do we also transition our campus and every, all these individual human beings on our campus from a, oh, I just throw it here, it's right next to my desk, I, th I throw everything in there, to 
frankly, more what they do at home, which is, oh, there's this bin and there's that bin. Um, that's a situation where there's a big technology improvement, big infrastructure improvement, but the key to the program is the behavior change. And understanding change management, we, I just hired a PhD in, in change management, basically, for my group to focus on things like this. But then to project manage that, I mean, we're talking about hundreds of buildings. And really, I mean, really stuff that's really personal to people that really, um, I mean, it affects their immediate work environment. And so we're bring, trying to bring all that together, not just on the glamorous energy side, but on the perhaps less glamorous uh, waste side. And frankly, everything in between. Okay, thank you very much, Lincoln. And um, I think we'll now pass it on to Jacques. Thanks, Richard. So I'm going to talk about um, computational tools and experiments for flexible urban energy systems. Uh, and the, the research I'm about to, uh, to discuss is made possible through support from Stanford Land Buildings and Real Estate, actually, and Dota Energies. And does this work? Perfect. Okay. So um, decarbonizing electricity and electrifying uh, heating, uh, cooling, and, land and um, light transportation, sorry, will get us about halfway there to net zero in the United States. That means that the electric grid is changing very fast, both on the supply side and on uh, the demand side. This map summarizes some recent research to track emissions through the US electricity system from generation to consumption while accounting for electricity exchanges. One, one big reason I'm putting this up here is to make the point that the grid is one giant interconnected machine. And so what we do on one side affects the other. Decarbonizing electricity means ejecting large shares of intermittent renewables at the site level and at the transmission level. So correspondingly, in the future grid, uh, flexibility in demand at the transmission level and at the site level will have tremendous value. More than that, uh, will be needed if we want to achieve our uh, electrification and decarbonization goals. What it's going to take to get there is practical solutions. I think uh, I, would say, I would say boring solutions, and, and that's what I want to talk about today. So first, I want to talk about some evidence we found that there's already today in today's grid significant amounts of flexibility that we can use to reshape and decarbonize electricity consumption. My case study is the campus energy system that Lincoln uh, introduced, uh, whose electricity consumption is roughly equivalent to a 30,000 people city in uh, California. This, this is my living lab. It's, uh, it's a perfect experimentation test bed because the 150 buildings or so on this campus are all managed by one entity, uh, Stanford Land Buildings and Real Estate. And this is my schematic for our integrated energy system. We have what's called a district uh, energy system on campus, which was almost fully electrified. Lincoln talked about this because uh, most of the heating and cooling that we're using in the buildings is produced on site at the central energy facility, uh, which uses large heat pumps uh, um, and to convert electricity into hot water and chilled water. The first source of flexibility I like to explore is in scheduling this heating and cooling plant. And uh, so we're facing a decision-making problem here, which is scheduling the different machines, the hourly operations for the different machines at the central energy plant. Uh, I, I want to minimize energy costs while meeting constraints in the plant and uh, meeting system demand for cooling, heating, and electricity. And so on the diagram here, I'm just showing you the chilled water side, but heating, cooling, electricity are all inter interdependent and connected here. So formally, what we're going to do is write down an optimization problem. We want to minimize some objective function uh, by choosing the optimal values for a set of decision variables while meeting constraints. The reason I'm showing this is that all of the applications I'm going to talk about next involve modifying this optimization problem in some way, whether it's changing the, uh, the objective function, adding new decisions, new constraints, or some combination of the three. The first example I'd like to talk about is a real world experiment. In the summer of 2018, we participated in a demand response program with Pacific Gas and Electric, the capacity bidding program. So in this program, we were paid to provide energy flexibility to the grid. 
Uh, so we modified that optimization program I was talking about uh, to include the payments in the objective function. We added new uh, decisions and uh, constraints in, uh, in, in, in the problem to model how we were delivering the flexibility. The, so in the plot on the left here, the, uh, the green line shows the total uh, electricity that's going to the central energy plant. So that's our dispatchable load, what we control. The orange line corresponds to the rest of the campus load, the electricity going to the buildings. That's our non-dispatchable load. And the blue line is what PG&E sees. That's the, what we're accountable for, which is total campus electricity load. Most of the flexibility for responding to these three events in July of 2018 is coming from flexibility associated with the tanks, the thermal storage tanks that I think Lincoln already showed this picture. Uh, this is really the bulk of the central energy plant, these storage tanks. This is our uh, battery, if you like. This is providing equivalent service to battery, but at a much cheaper cost. The second um, type of experiments I'd like to talk about are thought experiments. So here I'm showing the total campus electricity load, so heating uh, and cooling uh, for the, from the CEP and also the buildings over a year. And so that the heat maps here, each column corresponds to a day of the year, each row to an hour of the day. And the top one, uh, this is the optimal behavior if you want to uh, follow the current electricity tariff, which is telling us have load that's as flat as possible uh, every day. And when uh, the electricity is cheaper, for us that's typically in the, in the afternoon, consume a bit less. And so here, our, our peak load every month is somewhere between 30 and 35 megawatts under this scenario. In uh, the bottom one, I'm assuming we're paying a price on carbon that's so high that really all we want to do is shift as much load as we can from the night to the day because this is sunny California. So you know, this is a proxy for saying how much of that solar power can we absorb if we wanted to reshape consumption with the thermal storage. And here, the lows uh, dropped about 20 megawatts in the middle of the night and uh, jumped to 45 megawatts in the middle of the day. So next, I'd like to talk about some options that uh, might not be available right now, but would be available very soon uh, given investment. And the black box I'd like to open, what was until now a black box, is the energy consumption from the buildings on campus. So far, I've considered that's load that I have to meet uh, no matter what for heating, cooling, and electricity. So I'm going to change my optimization problem again, because uh, now I can do demand response. But this means, or what I'm calling thermal demand response. Uh, this means I'm going to add new cost functions. I'm going to add new uh, decision variables. For example, now I can change thermostat set points inside the buildings. Um, if you know, it gets to that, I can start to do some chill water curtailments, and I, I'm going to have new constraints. This is going to complicate my optimization problem because uh, now I need to, in, in addition to decisions inside the central energy plant, I need to make decisions in the 150 buildings on campus. These buildings are what are called commercial buildings. So the cooling comes to the buildings in the form of chilled water that's used to cool down air uh, at a central location in the building, which is then pushed through a central duct to the different uh, zones on campus. Uh, occupancy, uh, weather, uh, the, the building's physical characteristics, control systems all interact to determine what the building's cooling load is on a given day, which is why answering this question is not as trivial as it might seem. If I changed uh, the temperature set point by two degrees Fahrenheit in a subset of the zones, so two degrees Fahrenheit, that's uh, 1.1 degrees Celsius. Um, if I did that, how much would the cooling load drop over the course of a day? So we went out and started testing some buildings. And here I'm showing you some data uh, from one of the buildings on the engineering quad. So the y-axis here corresponds to uh, the daily cooling load for the building as measured through, through the chilled water loop. The x-axis corresponds to the mean daily temperature as measured at the campus weather station. Each dot is one day's worth of data. The blue dots correspond to uh, our base set point of 74 and the red uh, one degree higher. The difference between the two lines here, that's what we were trying to measure. What's the flexibility in the system if I increase these temperature set points? So we, we tested uh, three buildings in 2020, six in 2021, uh, 11 uh, just last summer, but testing all buildings on campus at this point we would have implemented the program. So we also worked on tools to extrapolate uh, the results that we found in buildings to the rest of the campus. This is our basic recipe in four steps. One, run tests in a subset of buildings. I talked about that. Second, uh, we collected a feature data set for all the buildings on campus, including the buildings we tested and the buildings we didn't test. Third, uh, so what the feature data set tells us is 
gives us an idea for how similar two buildings look. So with that information and information from the tests, we can generate estimates for what we think the flexibility would be in the buildings we haven't tested. And then fourth, we can combine our flexibility estimates for all the buildings on campus to estimate campus-wide load reductions. So overall, um, and I'll get to how I, uh, that number in a second, we think 14% is, or 13.5 13 to 14% is the aggregate flexibility we can get from campus. How do we get to that? So first, we, we ran these tests. We ran a lot of tests. We ran 1,200, you know, we, we collected something like 1,200 days of experiment data in 11 buildings over the course of three summers. Um, all of this is what was done with distributed sensors and actuators that were already inside the buildings. That allowed us to control about 1,300 uh, zones, which pre pretty much equate to rooms. Um, and importantly, we excluded 360 critical spaces, so things like uh, temperature-sensitive labs. Uh, we're calling these stress tests. Um, one, one reason they're valuable just as is is because they provide very directly relevant statistical information to uh, district energy system operators and electric grid uh, operators. They also are fed into these models I alluded to to extrapolate to the campus level and give us estimates for what the campus-wide potential for flexibility is. And so the, the curve I'm showing here, um, some of you may be familiar with curves like these on, uh, for electricity. This is what we're calling a chilled water uh, daily load duration curve. Um, each, so he, this is each day's worth of data for uh, campus cooling load in 2020, worst to easiest uh, from left to right. The blue curve is what actually happened. And the orange curve, that's our counterfactual low duration curve under 10 days of demand response. So this is what we think we could have seen, we could have achieved if we were doing demand response on campus. And so this is where my, the 14% number I was quoting from uh, earlier. And actually I want to, so there was a question from uh, Peter Rumsey earlier about uh, chill water curtailments. One, th this was one of the drivers for setting up this project three years ago, was thinking, okay, uh, at the, you know, back then, as Lincoln said, there was a, a capacity shortfall. We just didn't have enough. And so part of the question that I was asking at the time, or I wanted to ask with, with the, the, my partners on this project was, uh, what if you know, next time, the in the next five years or eight years down the road, we come up with this sort of decision again, do we need to spend uh, you know, that money to buy all that extra capacity, or uh, could we do things differently? So I just wanted to echo that. To finish, I'll just leave you with these three ideas. Uh, the grid is changing uh, very fast, and that change means that uh, flexibility in demand will have tremendous value already today, but even more in the years to come. Uh, in the grid of today, there's already significant amounts of untapped flexibility that's available for pretty cheap. You know, I, I think we've found evidence of that here. And given investment, tomorrow we can have a lot more uh, flexibility if we, uh, if we go look for it. We have about five minutes left, so um, any questions? A uh, quick question on your exclusion of your critical facilities. What percentage of the facilities across campus would you consider are critical in that model? That's a very good question. So, and that's actually one of the black boxes I was trying to open with this project. So there's currently, there is a critical list of you know, buildings being, uh, you know, and I think it's ranked from zero to five B, or there are six or seven levels. One of the difficulties with the current system is that this is not exactly the way the, the, the list is set. So, so Lincoln, correct me, but this is the way I understand it. You look inside the building. If there's a critical zone in the building, then that building becomes critical to that level. You know, whatever the worst level is, that's the level. What that means is that I think it's 80, 90% of the campus cooling load right now is critical. This is one of the black box I'm trying to, boxes I'm trying to open. And to say, instead of having a prior list that is per uh, uh, per build, you know, one, you know, one building at a time, can I have a prior list that is zone by zone? Uh, to answer your question, uh, about 40% of the, I think my, at least the number I have in mind is about 40% of the campus cooling load is for the hospital. But and a lar large fraction of that is critical loads, but they also have offices in uh, the hospital. Currently, you know, all that is sort of something that we don't want to touch. In the future, uh, uh, you know, why should my office be different from the hospital office, I guess is my question. And um, in the, maybe just to add one more thing on that, uh, in, so two of the 11 buildings I talked about that we tested were lab intensive buildings, and still 
you know, so we got less, less flexibility from those buildings because I was excluding a much larger number of zones, but still uh, we got three to 5% uh, percentage reduction in loads by controlling just the office portion of those buildings. So even, you know, even in this, uh, the buildings with sensitive loads, I expect you would, you would get something. A couple more layers of complexity there. One is that, as Jacques said, a building might have a laboratory, an office, a classroom, all sorts of different functionality with different levels of priority. The second part is that the distribution system, the electric distribution system, is set up like most electric distribution systems in that it is not, oh, here's a critical feeder and here's a non-critical feeder. You've got all sorts of different levels of criticality on the feeders, on each feeder. So it may be in a, in a, in a restart situation after an outage, you're turning on an absolutely vital building, but you're also turning on a coffee shop. And there's just no way around that without an army of technicians that, we, that nobody has. The third complication, maybe third and fourth complication, is that we do have emergency generators, but those are, how those are wired into buildings is not optimized for these sorts of events. And then what ends up getting plugged into those red outlets is up to the folks in the buildings. And so there's a, at a minimum, there's a situational awareness issue from the outside of the building into the, into the inside of the building. So this is something that we are, all of these things we are trying to unpack, but um, layers upon layers of complexity. And then as Jacques pointed out, everybody's work is important to them. Everybody's work is critical to them. And that's completely valid, but somehow we have to unpack that. Um, as an institution. So um, I think that's like seven layers of, of complexity there, but that's, the, that's what we're trying to figure out. Maybe just, I can't resist, to add one word to what Lincoln was saying about, you know, we can't control, you know, we, selectively, I would add the word currently. You know, currently we can't do that, but I, you know, that doesn't mean it's not possible. I think there was a question over there, yeah. Yeah, hi, Florian here. Yeah, it seems like you have found uh, wonderful ways to play around with the electrons. Uh, in a very flexible manner, so congratulations. I'm a little bit worried about the data security of this system and the overall security because the more decentral steering we have, the more IoT devices we have in this system, security becomes an issue. So maybe you can elaborate very briefly on your strategy to um, security in general, but also the data and the device side of security. I can talk a bit about that, yeah. Um, so one thing I can say is when we were running these experiments, um, so my, you know, my laptop doesn't have access to this. There, there's a different level, the same way that there's an IT system that controls that central energy plant, and that has some fail-safes safe around it. You, you have the same things in the buildings, and so there are different layers that you're adding at different parts that have different levers, layers of access. In other words, I'll say this a slightly different way. I don't control the actual devices inside the buildings when I was running these experiments. I, what I do control are control set points. You know, so I think it wouldn't be too difficult to add layers of protection within the building to say you know, there's a feasible range. If the outside system is trying to push something to me that's completely unreasonable, I'm just going to reject it and build in a fail safe that way. You know, in, in other words, and we're not, um, yeah, I, I, I think there are, there are ways that you can uh, work on this. Actually, sitting right next to you is Ram. Uh, Rodrigo Paul, who, who does uh, some of this work around uh, around <laughs> around uh, around electricity and and thinks about that. Okay, I think we have you know, time. So for I one think it more, is a concern, but yeah, one thanks. more quick question, and then we'll we'll have to, to finish off this session. I'm not familiar. This is David Chin with Murata again. Um, I'm not familiar with the building codes in California. Does, were there any building codes that you had uh, had to challenge? Or, or modify or you know, address? I can take that one. So, um, so no, I think is the short answer. I do think one, you know, one, one thing that your question does make me think of is that there will be a lot more fl uh, value for flexibility on the electrical system side if the building's code change. 
one way I know in which, in, in which they, it would be nice for them to change to, to unlock a lot more value for flexibility is currently, um, so I think the, the rule is basically you need to have enough copper on the system to take the worst case load. And you can't have, for example, a fail safe that's built based on software to say when the loads get too high, I'm gonna start shutting things down so that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't blow up. Um, currently, it has to be, there has to be enough hardware in there. If that, but that's just a rule, you know, uh, regulation. If that you know, was lifted and you could say, well, now I can count on the software to say if all the EVs are charging at the same time, but you know, when everything else is happening with software, I'm going to control that. Then you would lead a lot, not, you know, you, you could say I'm gonna have build a system with much less hardware. I think there you're gonna start seeing a lot of uh, investment value. Okay, I think we have to close this session. So please join me again in thanking our two speakers. And I'll move it over to sustainable transportation. <laughs>